actually, Pentecost is only a week away. And we are entering here this festival, this uh, uh, festival that is uh, uh, coming up. There are three festival seasons in God's plan, and Pentecost is the pivot festival. It's the one in the middle. Uh, the uh, Days of Unleavened Bread and Passover season uh, are the first of the festival seasons, and then the fall festival season is the third, and, and Pentecost is right in the middle. It is the pivot festival, and it's only a week away, and sometimes because Pentecost is the shortest of the festivals, uh, we perhaps don't focus quite as much on uh, uh, some of the significance as, as we certainly ought to, and I think you'll find... Uh, by the way, in your new Global News, which you'll be receiving this week, uh, that we have focused very much on Pentecost. Uh, the article's in there. Uh, Mr. Raymond McNair has a lead article, and it's entitled, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Pentecost, But Were Afraid to Ask. Uh, and you know how Mr. McNair can, can very thoroughly cover a subject. Well, he covered everything you wanted to know about Pentecost, uh, and then some of the rest of us wrote some other things uh, uh, on Pentecost. So, uh, uh, and Mr. McNair even had another article in there on Pentecost. So, uh, uh, a lot of things to cover about Pentecost. The, I want to focus in on one aspect of it and something that uh, sort of in preparation in our thinking uh, toward Pentecost and something that we don't uh, uh, we maybe haven't thought of in quite the same way. Pentecost focuses on the covenant. The old covenant began, was, was made with Israel on the day of Pentecost. Uh, you read that back in Exodus 19, Exodus 20, the first Pentecost the first uh, uh, feast of first fruits, as it commonly the terms in the Old Testament are feast of first fruits and feast of weeks. Uh, the New Testament uses uh, the Greek term Pentecost, which is the uh, basically the uh, the equivalent of feast of weeks. The, the Greek speaking Jews uh, referred to uh, the the feast of weeks uh, as Pentecost, which has to do with uh, uh, fifty, uh, referring to the fifty days uh, that are counted. Now. Exodus 19 and 20 shows that God made the Old Covenant at that time. Began His covenant relationship with Israel. And you can go back, you can go to Jeremiah 3, uh, where God talks about the fact that, uh, that I am married unto you, uh, as He says um, in, in uh, Jeremiah uh, chapter 3 and verse 14. Turn, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married unto you. It was a marriage covenant. God's relationship with Israel was a husband-wife relationship. God was in the role of the protector and the provider, and Israel was to be faithful to God. Uh, you find, if you go through Jeremiah chapter 3, he, he talks about how Israel, Israel's sin was, uh, from a spiritual standpoint, adultery. Israel was committing adultery uh, in, in that way. And, and God says, I am married to you. It was a marriage covenant. Well... In the New Testament, we find that, again, the relationship of Christ and the church, the, just as the Old Covenant had its beginning on the day of Pentecost, so we find the New Covenant. God began to make a new covenant. And we find the beginnings of that on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit was poured out. And again, God began the making of a new covenant, and it was a marriage covenant. You find the relationship of Christ and the church. The church is pictured as the espoused bride of Christ who will marry Christ at His return. We read of that in, in Revelation 19, you know, a very familiar scripture where it talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb, and, her, and His bride, His wife, has made herself ready. And to the bride and, 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 and to the church was given... Uh, that they should array themselves in fine linen, clean and white, which is the righteousness of the saints. You know, it describes uh, the, the clothing to be worn there. Now, I want to, to come back and focus on, on that a little bit because uh, there was definite spiritual significance. Uh, there, there are some very important things about our spiritual clothing about our spiritual clothing that relate to this day of Pentecost. Because if Pentecost looks forward to the completion of the new covenant that will culminate when the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place, we find that appropriate clothing for the marriage supper is, uh, is brought out. You see, it says in Revelation 19, 8, to her, well, in verse 7, it says, "...the marriage of the Lamb has come, his wife has made herself ready." To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. 
He says, Blessed are they that are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. The church is going to marry Christ. And yet it's very important as, as the church uh, prepares to uh, come into the presence of God uh, here and, and uh, the emphasis here on that in which the bride is arrayed. The spiritual clothing that is involved. Now, I want to look at some of what we're taught here concerning our spiritual clothing and recognize some of the uh, important lessons that are involved. Notice on the original day of Pentecost, recorded back in Exodus 19. In Exodus 19.1, we come to the third month when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt. You know, they left in the first month. Pentecost always comes in the first week of the third month. Now, here they had arrived here in the wilderness of Sinai. I won't go through all the the technical details to prove to you this was uh, 50 days uh, later from after the Exodus, but, uh, uh, you know, we, can't, we, we have gone through some of those things in times past. Uh, we have, I think, uh, an old correspondence course uh, that actually lays it out in chart form and goes through it in great detail. If some of you... Uh, uh, you know, don't have access to that or would like to study that out, perhaps we can uh, photocopy it and make it, uh, make it available. Uh, but notice, God says to the Israelites in Exodus 19, uh, uh, 4, uh, You've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak unto the children of Israel. In verse 8, the people said, All that the Lord has said, we will do. God proposed. God proposed, and they said, Yes. Now, God said, All right, let's get ready for the wedding. Verse, 9, verse 10, The Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. And be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And the, the Ten Commandments were actually going to be spoken. Uh, you find in verse 16, the third day in the morning, thunders and lightnings, a thick cloud. Uh, verse 18, Mount Sinai was all together on, on a smoke. The Lord descended upon it in fire. The whole mountain quaked greatly. Uh, you can just imagine... Uh, how uh, the people were just absolutely overwhelmed and overawed and intimidated. Can you imagine, uh, you know, God uh, coming down upon the mount in fire, in great power and glory, and the whole mountain just begins to shake and quake like a giant earthquake uh, as, the, as, as, in effect, God uh, descends here upon the mountain. And what they see is this tremendous billowing smoke. Uh, as though it were a volcano or something, uh, and, and this uh, this great fire coming down uh, from heaven, and, and the whole ground under their feet was shaking and, and quaking, uh, and they were shaking and quaking. You can you, you better believe. Um, you know Moses had been instructed to set bounds around the mountain so that they didn't come up and touch it. By the time all this was happening, nobody was wanting to get up there and touch it. You know, <laughs> Moses had to get them. You come on closer, and they said, "No, I think this is close enough." Uh, <laughs> The, uh, the point was, though, what did God give them? He told them for instructions. He said, now get ready. You have three days. Get ready. I want you to be sanctified. He told Moses, he said, sanctify them today and tomorrow and tell them to wash their clothes. Now, was the only thing God was trying to get across is the fact that, hey, you know, uh, you guys been out here in the desert and, man, uh, you know, you're sort of smelling a little bit and been walking around. You guys need to all go and wash your clothes and, and, and get your clothes clean. Is that, is that the only point? God was trying to make, you know, that, that uh, he, uh, was, it, was it purely a matter of sanitation and hygiene that he just wanted them to uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, sort of, how long has it been since you guys had a bath? You know, go, go take your bath, wash your clothes. Well, obviously, sanitation and hygiene is important, and there are many laws, uh, many, many of the statements that have direct relationships to that. But what we're going to see is that what God was giving them went far beyond simply a matter of physical sanitation and hygiene. That is important, and that was an underlying physical principle, but there is a spiritual principle that goes on beyond. They were told that they were going to come into the presence of God. They needed to wash their clothes. They needed to appear before God in clean garments. 
in clean garments. Now, they physically washed their clothes and appeared before God in physically clean garments, and obviously uh, that is certainly a valid principle. I mean, you, you know, we don't want to, uh, we, we wouldn't go out, you know, sort of, uh, of course we're not supposed to be working on the Sabbath anyway, but you know, come out and uh, mow the yard and, and be all stinky and sweaty and, and have on our old uh, dirty clothes and say, well, you know, I think I'm about ready to go to church now. Uh, that that uh, wouldn't be very uh, respectful for uh, for God, but, but the... The point that God was trying to get across was not just purely a matter of them washing their clothes. It was that the understanding that we appear be, we are ultimately, if we are to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb, we must appear before God in spiritually clean garments. Notice in Leviticus 8, when here we have the consecration of Aaron as priest. And notice... Um, in verse, uh, uh, Moses did what God said, and in verse 6, Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. And then we find in verse 7 that he put upon Aaron the special priestly garment. Now you can come on back to Leviticus 16, where Aaron was told in verse 2 not to come at all times into the holy place within the veil. You don't just come into the very presence of God, which the Holy of Holies symbolized in a careless, casual, lackadaisical manner, just a very, uh, just any old way. You know, this was, this was important. God used physical things, and obviously it is a matter of physical respect. You know, the way that we appear before God uh, on, on the Sabbath and, and, and all of that is, it is a matter of respect toward God. Uh, and, and the way that we conduct ourselves and we teach our little children those things, you know, uh, that, uh, that this is special. But here, they, he was coming into the tabernacle which symbolized the very throne of God. And so he was told that as he came into the presence of the throne of God, there was a special, special thing he was to do. And notice what he was to, to do. In verse 4, he shall put on the holy linen coat. And he shall have the linen breeches upon his, fre- his flesh, shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with a linen miter shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. Now, the point of Leviticus 16 was not simply the fact, well, Aaron, you ought to take a bath every so often. Uh, you know, it was something that went beyond that. Aaron didn't show up at the tabernacle uh, you, you know, all filthy. He'd been out working in the, in the garden, you know, and he sort of showed up, and he was all smelly and filthy, and God said, I think you'll take a bath before you come in here. No, that, that was not... That wasn't the way Aaron showed up. But he washed himself at that time. It was a ceremonial washing. Uh, it symbolized the fact you've got to be clean. You wash, put on the holy garment. Garments that were only worn in the presence of God. They were only worn in the tabernacle. That's why they're called holy garments, because they were garments that came into the presence of God. They were linen, clean linen, pure and white. Now, does that sound familiar? We just read about pure linen, clean and white back in Revelation 19, didn't we? That when we appear before God at the marriage supper, we're going to have on... The, it was granted that we will be arrayed in pure linen, clean and white. Why? Because we're told in Revelation 19 that the the pure linen, clean and white, symbolizes the righteousness of the saints. So Aaron was to appear before God clean, he washed himself, and arrayed in robes of righteousness. He was to be clean and to put on righteousness. This is what is symbolized here as he entered the presence of God. Now, you and I have all been places. You ever seen a sign where it says, no shirt, no shoes, no service? Well, you know, God has a similar sign up. Back in Matthew 22, we read about it. Here's a fellow that uh, uh, we're going to see. There are three ways. Uh, to get in trouble at the wedding supper, you know, you can if you show up inappropriately attired at the wedding wedding supper, uh, you're you're in trouble. Now there there are different ways of being wrong. Only one way to be right, but there are a bunch of ways to be wrong. Uh, there, there are three that I want to call your attention to. Matthew 22. 
Uh, verse 1. Jesus answered, and he spoke unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. So here we have a marriage supper picture. So this ought to remind us of what we read back in, in Revelation 19. We find that those who had first opportunity to come didn't appreciate that opportunity, and others were called. And then, notice, verse 11, when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how came you in here not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh my, you know, that's worse than getting told uh, no shirt, no shoes, no service. Uh, to be taken and bound, tied up, thrown out in the outer darkness. Why did this happen? Well, the king said, Friend, you don't have on a wedding garment. Now, this fella that showed up at the wedding supper, he was under a, a mis- uh, uh, he had uh, a faulty idea that is common in the Protestant world. You know, I, I, I grew up in the Baptist church. A lot of you came out of various churches. You remember, you, you remember the old song that we used to sing uh, at the end of the service, you know, when, it, when they'd have the altar call and sing, Just as I am. Just as I am. This fellow thought that he could come just as he was. He didn't need to change. He had been called to the wedding supper, and he said, I'll come. Sure, I'll be there. And he just showed up just the way he was. He didn't change. He didn't get rid of the filthy garment. He didn't clean up his wife. He didn't make any changes. He just showed up as he was. And the king said, "Uh uh-uh, not in here that way you don't. Take him out. There are those who seem to operate under the premise that all you've got to do is just believe. You, You don't have to make changes in your life. You don't have to repent. You don't have to obey God. You don't have to turn around and go the other way in your life. Just come as you are. The wedding supper of the Lamb is not a come-as-you-are affair. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 7, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, you know, that'd be a real shock to a lot of people. They think that's all you got to do. Well, you know, I believe in Jesus. Boy, that's, that's, I'm, I'm saved. You know, you came out of some of those backgrounds. You, you, you understand that. That's, that's what a lot of us thought at one time. Christ said in Matthew chapter 7, very clear statement. Um, that um, uh, verse 20, Matthew 7, verse 20. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. You know, people will say, oh, but Lord, I, haven't I done all these wonderful things in your name? In verse 23, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity, you that practice lawlessness. Now, that's the first category. This man didn't have on clean garments. He didn't have on uh, the, the garments of righteousness. He just came as he was. He didn't see the need to make any changes in his life. He got the invitation to come to the wedding supper. He thought he'd just come as he was. The king said, oh, no, you don't. Out you go. So the first thing we see if we want to be at the wedding supper of the Lamb is we can't come as we are. We can't just remain the way we've been. We've got to be serious about making changes in our lives. We've got to repent of sin, which means to turn away from the old way. We've got to repent. We've got to make some changes that's necessary. Now, let's go back to the book of Revelation. I want to show you a couple more categories of individuals who, again, run into problems at the wedding supper. second category we read of here in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1 is addressed, the message is addressed to the church in Sardis. It has the name that it's alive and yet it's really spiritually dead. Notice on down here in verse 4 of Revelation 3. 
You have a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk before me, or they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcomes, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I'll confess his name before my father and before his angels. Now, what we find is there are a few in Sardis that have not defiled their garments, which means most in Sardis have defiled their garments. There are many in Sardis that have defiled their garments. There are a few that have. Now, here were people that did change clothes. They put on clean garments, but then they got them dirty. They got them defiled. Now, what does it mean to be clothed in white? Verse 5, he that overcomes the same to be clothed in white raiment. So here are those who weren't quite in the category with the first man. They did change their clothes, but they proceeded to get them dirty. They began to, to drift back into the world. They did not overcome. And so their garments became defiled. To be defiled means to, to be unclean, to, to be rendered uh, to be rendered dirty in that way. So here were people. Here was here's a group that did not overcome. They didn't see the necessity of really going forward in terms of their obedience to God. It, it became empty. It became just sort of a shell, and, and they really didn't overcome. They. Uh, were spiritually dead. And their garments are were defiled. Uh, they got them dirty again. And so they are not going to walk, uh, they're not going to be there. Though the few names that have, uh, those that have overcome, uh, will be clothed in white raiment and will not be blotted out. So here we see a group of people who failed to overcome. They failed to go false. You know, we make initial changes, but we've got to go forward in our relationship with God to become more and more like God. Developing God's character. We all make initial changes, or we're supposed to when we come in. We stop doing certain things, we start doing certain things. That's the spiritual starting point. But it's not the point of it, we haven't arrived we've got to overcome we've got to put forth effort to to go forward in the development of godly character now let's notice here a third category we see first bunch didn't change clothes came as they were second bunch changed clothes but went out and got them dirty again didn't didn't keep their clothes clean third bunch well down in verse 14 church of the Laodiceans notice what we're told about them Verse 17, because you say I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and know not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. This bunch took their clothes off. First bunch didn't change. Second bunch changed and then got them dirty. Third bunch, third bunch took them all off, got rid of them, didn't have any. So, now they're really in trouble. You know, you talk about a bad way to show up at a wedding supper. Uh, they showed up, and they didn't have any clothes on. Well, he says in verse 18, I counsel you, I've got some advice for you, buy of me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich and white raiment, that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. So they needed, to, they needed to be able to see. They, here, here they were. They had their clothes off. They couldn't even see that they didn't have any on. They thought they were in great shape. They were sort of like the emperor that had no clothes. He thought he had on this beautiful robe. Boy, you know, you're, here, look, you see my robe? Well, what everybody, well, you know, what God sees is your robe, nothing. You don't have anything on. Now, you're not going to get into the wedding supper that way. You know, you can't, you can't get in just coming as you are and never making any changes. You can't get in making some initial changes but failing to go forward and to overcome and just getting your garments all defiled and filthy again. And you certainly can't get in if you take them all off and throw them away. 
show up at the door naked. That's not the way to get into wedding stuff. So uh, here we find three different categories that none of us want to be in. If we want to, to be a part of the fulfillment of Pentecost that's up and coming in a week, if we want to be part of the fulfillment of that, that means we want to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so here are three categories that are important to avoid if we're going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let's notice back in Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. So he's clothed me with the garments of salvation and decked me with the robe of righteousness. We want to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Now, let's begin, let, let's begin to focus in here in the remainder of the sermon about what's involved in that. You know, we, we see that there are categories we want to avoid. We've got to change clothes. We've got to keep our clothes clean. We've got to keep our clothes on. You know, three things to remember. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's obvious, you know, you've got a whole era of people that are described and, uh, that they, they didn't know they had to keep them on. You know, sort of like a little kid running around, you know. You get him dressed and, and here they come out, you know, and parents are mortified. You know, a little child come, uh, comes running out and he's got his clothes off and, 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 and he's oblivious to the fact. Uh, and and uh, wants, uh, you know, mommy to come and, and uh, uh, help him or whatever it is. Uh, that uh, uh, we... Uh, we want the garments of salvation and the robes of righteousness. Now, let's, let's go back and let's understand a little bit about what it means to be clean. God gave ancient Israel laws that specifically related to clean and unclean, to being holy and being unholy. The responsibility of the priesthood in ancient Israel was to teach the people to discern between the clean and the unclean, between the holy and the profane. They were to learn to, they were to teach the people to make distinctions. Have you ever thought about the fact God has chosen something that is so fundamental, so basic? There's something we do every day, virtually. You know, we may occasionally, hopefully we do occasionally skip a day, but it's something we normally do every day or just about every day. And not only do we do it once a day, we do it several times a day. We eat. You can't go without eating for an indefinite period of time. You know, we can, all of us go without it perhaps longer than we think we can, but uh, uh, the time will come when you will die. We take in and ingest food on a regular basis several times a day. And God did something. He took something that is so elemental, so physical, so basic, and he designed and created things. When, when he created animals, God created some animals where their flesh is designed to be consumed and eaten as food. Other animals were designed in such a way that their flesh was not to be consumed and eaten for food. Some animals were created clean and some were created unclean. Do you ever think God could have just simplified things and made them all clean? Couldn't, couldn't he? I mean, why, why couldn't he? He could have given every animal a digestive system. You know, all mammals could have had a digest, digestive system like a cow. He could have created all animals to be eaten and clean. God purposely designed some of them so you couldn't eat them. And he designed others so you could. And he said... Now, every time you go to eat, which is something you're doing every day, I want you to think in terms that you have to avoid certain things because that's unclean, and you have to choose other things because that's clean. And I want you reminded of that on a regular basis. It's a physical law that is there to teach a spiritual principle, that we have to learn to make distinctions between what is clean and what is unclean. God designed that in. He gave many of the laws to ancient Israel relating to cleanliness. And they're laws that, that certainly are rooted in principles of sanitation, of hygiene, uh, uh, laws of quarantine. 
laws that are designed to stop the spread of disease, to, to, to promote uh, sanitary living conditions. And that's true. And there, these are physical principles that are to be observed. And frankly, some of these things were practiced in, in some of the third world nations of the world. Uh, the death rate would fall dramatically. You know, they quit dumping raw sewage in the streets. Uh, it's just one simple thing. Uh, the, the law that's given here in, in Deuteronomy 23, uh, where it talks about uh, that uh, in verse 12, you shall have a place also without the camp. This is talking about when the armies went out, uh, the way that they were to set things up. You're to have a place without the camp, whether you shall go forth abroad. And you shall have a paddle upon your weapon, and it shall be uh, when you will ease yourself abroad, you shall dig therewith and shall turn back and cover that which comes from you. Now, that's, that's pretty basic. Uh, very uh, fundamental physical need of human beings, and, and God gave them detailed instructions uh, about it. Was it only because of sanitation? God said, look, I, you know, you do this because if you don't, disease will spread through the camp and malaria and, and, and uh, typhoid and all sorts of diseases. No, notice what he said. Now, that's all true. There would disease would spread through, and all sorts of contagion. But notice in verse fourteen: For the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and to give up your enemies before you. Therefore shall your camp be holy, that He see no unclean thing in you and turn away from you. You see, God used a spirit, a physical principle a physical matter to teach a spiritual principle, and that is the fact that God does not dwell in the midst of uncleanness. And so they were told, look, when you need to relieve yourself, go outside the camp, dig a hole, and bury it. And they were told the reason, God didn't go through and spend pages explaining about germs and, 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 and all this other stuff. He said, I'm going to be walking up and down in the midst of your camp, and you can't see me, but I'm going to be walking in your camp. And I do not dwell in the midst of uncleanness. You've got to be clean. Now, God was teaching them a principle of spiritual and moral cleanness that went beyond just the matter of sanitation and hygiene. Yes, sanitation and hygiene is there. I understand that. But there are spiritual lessons. You know, it talks about... Let's, let's go back to Numbers 19. I want to call your attention to something. You know, as we see in terms of purification, Numbers 19, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and said, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord commanded. Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer without spot. God wanted a red. He didn't want a black Angus. He didn't want, you know, some other kind. He didn't want a white Charlotte. He wanted a red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish and upon which never came yoke. And you shall give her to Eleazar the priest, that he may bring forth without the camp, and, shall, and one shall slay her before his face. And Eleazar the priest shall take of her blood with his finger and sprinkle of her blood directly before the tabernacle of the congregation seven times. And one shall burn the heifer in his sight. Her skin, her flesh, her blood, with her dung shall he burn. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet, scarlet cloth, and cast it into the midst of the burning of the heifer. Now, this was a strange ceremony. They took this heifer out here in the wilderness. They took the heifer out, and they slit her throat. They slaughtered her. She fell down, of course, dead, slaughtered. They didn't dress her and, 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 and consume any of the flesh. They built up this pyre of wood, and they kept adding to it cedar wood. And they started this wood. They kindled this wood and, and, and ignited this great pyre that burned this slaughtered heifer and everything that pertained to her, everything there, and they kept adding cedar wood to the fire and putting on hyssop, and they added scarlet cloth. And this was kept burning until the whole, uh, that, that whole uh, heifer was totally consumed and turned to ashes. You know, very hot fire that kept burning and kept burning uh, until everything there was totally burned up. And notice here, the priest shall wash his clothes, and he shall bathe his flesh in water. And afterward he'll come into the camp, and the priest shall be unclean until the even. And he that 
he that burns her shall wash his clothes in water, bathe his flesh, and be unclean until the evening. And the man that is clean, a man that is clean, shall gather up the ashes of the heifer, and lay them up without the camp in a clean place, and it'll be kept for the congregation, for a water of of separation. It is a purification for sin. He that gathers the ashes of the heifer will wash his clothes, be unclean until evening, and it shall be unto the children of Israel, and upon the stranger that sojourns among them a statute for us. Now, we're going to see, as we come on into Hebrews, we're going to see how that statute applies to that. Now, he that touches the dead body of any man shall be unclean seven days. And he shall purify himself with it. Speaking of this water of purification, on the third day and the seventh day, he shall be clean. Uh, if he doesn't purify himself on the third day and the seventh day, he will not be clean. Uh, this is uh, the law, verse 14. Uh, if a man dies in a tent, all that's in the tent, all that's, uh, uh, all that come into the tent, all that's in the tent will be unclean seven days. And every open vessel that doesn't have a covering bound upon it is unclean. And uh, whosoever touches one that is... Uh, a slain with a sword and it goes on uh, is unclean now notice what happens to the to someone who's unclean an unclean person verse 17 for an unclean person they shall take of the ashes of the burned heifer for purification of sin and they take that take some ashes and mix it with running water to get water out of a running stream and put it in a vessel and a clean person shall take hyssop which was used to scrub with and they took hyssop and dip it in the water and sprinkle it upon the tent and upon the vessels and upon the person. And the clean person, verse 19, shall sprinkle upon the unclean on the third day and on the seventh day. And on the seventh day, the person who's been sprinkled with the water of purification, he shall purify himself and wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be clean at evening. The man that shall be unclean and shall not purify himself, that soul shall be cut off. This is a verse 21. It shall be a perpetual statute upon unto them that he that sprinkles the water of separation shall wash his clothes. He touches the water of separation shall be unclean till evening. So we find that there were two aspects of becoming clean. One was you had to, you had to be sprinkled with the water of purification on the third day and on the seventh day. That was something that had to be done for you. You could not do for yourself. Once you were unclean, contaminated, I understand when you go through, there are laws of sanitation and hygiene and quarantine. People come in, somebody's died, they come in contact with what may be a contagious disease. They're excluded from the camp. Uh, the, you know, vessels that were open in there, you know, maybe somebody's been lying there and they've been coughing and sneezing and, and, and they had some uh, disease that, that uh, you don't know what it is and and uh, there are vessels that were laying around open that uh, who knows, you know, what germs are there. So so here are principles. Yes, it has a basis in terms of laws of sanitation and hygiene, but it goes beyond that. There's no physical benefit to taking some ashes of a red heifer, you know, as opposed to a black heifer or any kind of heifer. Ashes of a red heifer that have been burned with cedar wood, with hyssop, and with red cloth, taking a little bit of those ashes and mixing it with running water, dipping a hyssop into that bowl and sprinkling on the person on the third day and the seventh day. That was something the individual could not do for himself. It had to be done for him, and without it, he could never be made pure. Once he had become defiled, he had to be sprinkled with the water of purification. But then he, that, that was done for it. The priest did that. But there was something he had to do for himself. He had, on the seventh day, he had to wash himself and he had to wash his clothes. He had to bathe himself and he had to wash his clothes. So there are two aspects of becoming clean and being able to re-enter the presence of God. One was done for us and the other we had to do for ourselves. Now, that's important to understand because now let's go back to the book of Hebrews. Begin to put some of this together here.
Okay, well, in, in Hebrews 10.22, it talks about, let us draw near. Uh, verse 21. Um, well, let, let's, let's go on up here in, in, uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, Hebrews 10. We'll pick it up uh, in verse 18. Where remission of sin is, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having, therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest, to enter into the holy of holies, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure, with pure water. You see, we're told in verse 13 of Hebrews 8, or Hebrews 9, excuse me, Hebrews 9, verse 13, if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean if that sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, they were defiled ceremonially. You see, we're told that the thing in verse 9 of Hebrews 9, we're told that the things that, the, of the, the things that pertain to the Old Testament tabernacle service were a type for the time then present. It was a, it was a type. It could not make those who did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed upon them until the time of Reformation. If you want to know what aspects of the law were done away, it's spelled out right here. Four things. The food offerings, the drink offerings, the various washings, and the, and the physical ceremonies. Those were imposed upon them until the time of Christ. You see, the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified and allowed an individual to be readmitted into the presence of God in a physical sense. Now, that individual also had to scrub himself and his clothes. He had to be sprinkled with the, with the water of purification. How much more shall the blood of Christ purge our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You see, they were contaminated, they were defiled because they came in contact with a dead body. They came in contact with something that was physically dead, and that's a source of, of physical contagion and contamination. They were separated, cut off, because God dwelt in the midst of the camp. God doesn't dwell in the midst of uncleanness, so they were separated. And they had to be made clean. That was a type. That was a symbol. What defiles us? Not the touching of a dead body. That doesn't spiritually defile you. Coming in contact with dead works. That's what we need to be purged from, dead works. What are dead works? Well, works that end in death. Go back and read in Galatians, the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh lead to death. That's what we're told. Let's just turn back there in Galatians. It says in, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, The works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lawlessness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations. That just means jealousies. You notice that that's listed right in here. You know, we, we, we look and say, boy, you know, adultery, fornication, that's terrible. Well, so is hatred. 
So is jealousy. So is wrath. So is strife and sedition and heresy and envy and murder and drunkenness and revelings. And such like of which I tell you before, as I've told you in times past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, we can't live that way. Those are the works of the flesh, and they lead to death. They exclude us from the presence of God. But God makes possible for defilement to be removed. He makes possible for our defilement to be removed, and, and that happens two ways. Or there are two aspects of that. One is the water of purification. That's something we can't generate within ourselves and do for ourselves. Christ died for us. He paid the penalty, and it's only through His sacrifice that our conscience can be purged from dead works, that we can be changed. But we also have to do something. The individual who was going to be cleansed from defilement, the priest had to sprinkle him with the water of purification. But what else? The individual himself had to do something. He had to wash himself. He had to wash his flesh. He had to scrub himself. He had to wash his clothes. See, we've got to make some changes in our life. We've got to respond. Now, if the individual washed himself and never received the water of purification, he wasn't clean. If he received the water of purification and didn't wash himself, he wasn't clean. It took both. Now, let's just notice here in Isaiah, 5, in Isaiah 1. Isaiah 1. Verse 15, When you spread forth your hands, I'll hide my eyes from you. When you make many prayers, I'll not hear. Your hands are full of blood. They're defiled. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do well. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Eternal. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So here there was a cleansing must take place. We must be cleaned up. We must be washed and scrubbed. How do you do that? Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes cease to do evil. So it involves a change, a turning away from sin, a repentance. You know, John the Baptist came preaching what? The baptism of repentance. He said, repent. And he symbolically washed them in water, a sim, uh, a symbolize, symbolizing a washing away of sin, purging or a, a washing away of defilement, of uncleanness. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, First Corinthians chapter 6, in verse 11, or verse 9, it says, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And notice verse 11. And such were some of you. Such were some of you. But you're washed. You're sanctified. You're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You see, we were all in a state of spiritual defilement. Maybe some of us had touched one unclean thing. Others of us had touched other unclean things. The point is, we were all unclean. We were all defiled. None of us, of and by ourselves, are worthy and fit to enter into the presence of God. None of us can come just as we are. God didn't look down and see you or see me and say, Boy, I'm so impressed with Him. He's so good. I've got to have Him. 
He didn't say that. You know, that's not what he said when he saw me, and that's not, I don't think he said that when he saw any of you. He was just so impressed. He just had to have him. That's the best person I've, I've ever seen. You know, I just got to have him. We were all in a state of spiritual defilement. But God makes, makes possible our spiritual cleansing. It's a cleansing that starts on the inside. It's not just the sanctification of the flesh. It's purging our conscience of dead works. Getting rid of sin from the inside out. We've got to do something. We've got, it says we need to you know, wash our flesh and, 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 and wash our clothes. We've got to respond. You see, it takes our cooperative effort. Our cooperative effort with God's initiative that makes possible. In Isaiah 52, you know, there's a very, very plain statement that, that ties in with all of this about clean and unclean. In Isaiah 52, verse 11, it says, Depart you, depart you, go you out from hence, touch no unclean thing, go you out of the midst of her, be you clean that bear the vessels of the eternal. You know, you can tie that in back in Revelation 18 where, where it talks about Babylon the Great, and it says, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you be not partakers of her plagues. We're told to depart, to come out, to touch not the unclean thing, to be clean that bear the vessels of the eternal. It is necessary that we take God's way of life seriously. And that's very important. We've got to be cleansed. And that cleansing that we do, Christ made possible our sanctification. He made possible our purification spiritually through His sacrifice. But notice what it says back in Titus 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy. See, that's why He called us. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, we haven't inherited eternal life yet. We are heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We have the earnest of that inheritance within us. That's God's Holy Spirit. And that earnest of the inheritance, you know, any of you have ever bought a house, you, you put down earnest money. That was the guarantee that you were going to come back and fulfill the terms of the agreement. God, Spirit, we're told in Ephesians 1, is the earnest of our inheritance. Because if the Spirit of Him that raised up Christ from the dead dwells in you, your mortal body shall He also quicken by that Spirit that dwells in you. That's what we're told in Romans 8. Now, it's according to His mercy that we're saved. By the washing of regeneration and renewal, you see, that comes from the Holy Spirit, the washing of, of, of being uh, regenerated, renewed through the Spirit which is shed on us, we're justified, made innocent, so that we can be heirs. Christ's sacrifice made possible our forgiveness. Now let's go back, let's see a little more of... of what it is that is our part, how we go up about cleaning up our part. You know, God's done His part. Jesus Christ offered Himself as one sacrifice for sins forever. The water of purification is there. That was symbolized in <coughs> baptism. But let's, let's understand a little more of what we need to do. Ephesians 5 Verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it. Why did Christ give himself for the church? He wants to sanctify, set it apart, make it holy, and cleanse it. How? With the washing of water by the Word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it would be holy and without blemish. 
You see, the bride is going to be adorned in clean linen, pure and white. Not an old spotted up, wrinkled garment that, that uh, you know, looks like it's been used as bedding for the dogs for, uh, you, know, you know, the last several weeks. Uh, that's, not, that's not what is talked about here at all. It will be not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. It will be holy and without blemish. Clean linen, pure and white. The righteousness of the saints. Now, how is it going to be washed? It will be cleansed and washed. Water, uh, washing of water by the Word or through the Word or in the Word. Uh, the word uh, that's translated by here is actually the, uh, the Greek word most commonly translated in. It could also be rendered through. So, a washing of water through or in or by the Word. Now, let's, let's come on back here to John 15 and let's notice a little more. I think some things will begin to come together. John 15, 3, Jesus said to the disciples, You are clean through the Word which I have spoken unto you. On over in John chapter 17, John chapter 17, and uh, uh, up here in uh, verse, the, uh, uh, verse 11, he said, I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your own name those that you have given me, that they may be one as we are. Now, you know, some have seemingly gotten all confused about how Christ and the Father are one. Well, if we let the Bible interpret the Bible, we don't run into confusion. Christ explained how He and the Father are one. They're one in the same way you and I can all be one with one another and one with God. It says, Holy Father, keep through your own name those whom you've given me, that they may be one as we are. Now, are Christ and the Father one? Well, it says right here, the Bible interprets itself. Coming on down, verse 14, I've given them your word. And the world has hated them because they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil, keep them from contamination and defilement. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. How are we sanctified? How are we set apart? How are we cleansed? Through God's word through God's truth. God's Word is truth. We are sanctified. We are cleansed through the water and the Word. When they cleansed themselves in, in ancient Israel, what did they do? They used, uh, they used the hyssop to, to scrub with in, in, in water. They, they scrubbed themselves with water and with hyssop. Uh, and, and they went through that scrubbing and then uh, the priest took hyssop and dipped it in, which was a, an article that, that uh, uh, or a, uh, it, it symbolized, uh, uh, symbolized cleansing, and they, he took it and dipped it in the water of purification and, and sprinkled that upon them. You know, David, in his psalm of repentance, prayed to God, purge me with hyssop. It was, had to do with cleansing. Now, when we were washed in water and the Word, the two go hand in hand together. You know, there are people who've studied the Bible for years. And, and have never gotten the point. Look at the monks of the Middle Ages. Did they study the Bible? Well, some of them spent their lifetime copying out the Scriptures by hand. I don't imagine any of you have ever made a copy of the Bible, you know, written it out by hand from Genesis to, to Revelation. You know, some of those monks in the, in the Middle Ages made, made several copies. They spent their lifetime copying manuscripts. They spent a lot of time with the Bible. What... How much of it did they understand? Well, if they'd understood very much, they wouldn't have been monks, would they? It's not how much time you spend. Now, obviously, you've got to spend some time, and we need to spend time. I'm not, detract, I'm not talking about that. But, you know, here, here were people that, that, that spent years copying it out. There, there are all sorts of, uh, you know, professors and, at seminaries and various things but, you know, the, 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 the Word really doesn't do them any good because they don't get the point. The Spirit is not working with them. The Spirit opens our mind to understand the Bible. It makes it living. 
But on the other hand, just the Spirit working with you, you know, it's not just that the, 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 the Spirit just sort of comes and you get all these feelings. The Spirit of God opens our mind to understand the Scriptures. We've got to study the Scriptures and apply them. God's Word is here as a cleansing agent. We are, we, we are cleansed by the washing of water and the Word. So God's Holy Spirit empowering us, God's Word enlightening us, and as we study God's Word, as we seek God's help and more of God's Spirit, and as we seek to apply what we read in the Word with the help of God's Spirit, we're in the process of cleansing, of bathing, of washing our spiritual garments. Our purification is made possible through the sacrifice of Christ, but we must act on that by following through, just as it said back in Numbers, in washing our flesh in the water and washing our garments. We've got to make changes. God makes possible our purification, which makes possible our acceptance by Him. But we've got to make changes in our life. We can't come just as we are. We've rather got to come in an attitude of surrender, an attitude of, of desiring God to really clean us up. That's why we're, we're told here in, in uh, Colossians chapter 1, in verse 21, you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight if... That's the biggest little two-letter word in the English language. If you continue in the faith grounded and saddled. Oh, he didn't say be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. He didn't say if you continue in the chair you've been sitting in, you know, for, for X number of years. He says if you continue in the faith. That's what you have to continue in. You've got to continue in the faith. Which faith? Well, the faith Jude told Christians to earnestly contend for, the faith once and for all delivered unto the saints. Do you know how the, do you, do you know how the Catholic Church explains away the fact that the New Testament Scriptures do not clearly teach the Trinity? You, you can go check this up in Catholic Encyclopedia writing on it. They acknowledge that you can't get a clear explanation of the Trinity from, from the New Testament. They, 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 they admit that. They admit that Paul did not teach the Trinity, clearly. They, they, they do. They, what they say is that Paul did not fully understand the nature of God. It awaited further revelation which came through men such as Origen and Tertullian, the early church fathers, the anti-Nicene fathers, as, they call, as they're called. In other words, the, the fathers of the Catholic Church prior to the Council of Nicaea back in the 2nd uh, and 3rd century. That these were the men that came to a full understanding. In fact, they say, you know, Paul had only a binary concept of God. And by that they meant that Paul spoke of, of the Father and of Christ as being individuals, and he had not fully come to a Trinitarian concept, but, you know, they, they, that was developed. They, they, they acknowledge that. They, they say that. Uh, the, uh, you know, one of, one of the clearest proofs that even the Catholics and, uh, couldn't find any Scripture in the, in the New Testament that they could use to justify the Trinity is, is evidenced by the fact that they inserted one in First John. You don't have to insert a verse, you know, if you don't... And, and you can prove that that was inserted. I don't know of any, uh, of any commentary uh, or of any serious commentator or scholar on the Bible that doesn't acknowledge that that uh, section, that, you know, that verse that, uh, you know, these three bear witness in heaven, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit there in First John, uh, virtually any commentary that I have ever seen uh, all admit that this was added in in the early Middle Ages. It's, it's not really any big... Uh, Secret. It didn't appear in any of the early uh, Greek manuscripts. It, it, it originated in the Latin. And, and, you know, you don't go to the trouble to add something in if you could find something there to support yourself to begin with. But you see, their concept, and, and many Protestants teach this as well, of, of progressive revelation. Progressive revelation. Well, Jude, evidently, he was only Christ's brother, you know, so maybe he didn't understand a whole lot. Uh, Jude said 
earnestly contend for the faith once and for all delivered. No progressive revelation. The faith was once and for all delivered. And it, who was it delivered to? Well, it was delivered to the apostles. It was delivered to, to Peter and James and John. It was delivered to Paul and to Jude. It was once and for all delivered to the first century apostles. And he says, earnestly contend for the faith once and for all delivered. Paul says here, we were all at one time enemies. We were alienated. We were, we were cut off from God by wicked works. We were enemies in our mind. Our, our, our mind wasn't attuned to the things of God. We weren't tuned in to God. We've been reconciled. We have been purified through the offering of Jesus Christ so that we can be presented holy and unblameable if you continue in the faith, the faith once and for all delivered. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So, very important concept, very important thing to understand. We've got to continue in the faith, grounded and settled, stable and solid, not tossed to and fro, to continue to go forward, obeying God, overcoming, trying to, to strive to have more and more of the mind of Christ. So, you know, we're told in, in Hebrews chapter 8 when it talks about the new covenant. You see, this is the covenant that I will make, God says. Hebrews chapter 8. He tells us in verse 7, if that first covenant had been faultless, no place would have been sought for the second. The covenant that was initiated in Exodus 19 had a fault. What was the fault? Was the fault with God? Maybe the fault was with the Ten Commandments. No. Verse 8, for finding fault with them. Fault wasn't with the law and it wasn't with God. The fault was with the people finding fault with them. He says, behold, the days... Come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant. They did not continue in the faith. That's why he found fault with them, and I regarded them not. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God, and they will be to me a people. The new covenant is God is putting His laws in our hearts and in our minds. Not just writing it with His finger on tables of stone, but writing it with His Spirit in our hearts and in our minds. It is a transformation from the inside out. You know, in Romans 12, 2, it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be, be not conformed. You know what conformity is? It's to fit in with. Most of you have seen like these little, uh, you, you know, the little, uh, 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 well, the, the little forms uh, like you get with uh, little kids maybe have with play, Play-Doh or something where you can fit it in, and it, it derives its shape. It may come out, you know, be a little dog or a little cat or a little tree or whatever it is, or maybe, you know, in cooking, you, you have molds and, and maybe a gelatin salad or, or even a, a, like a bunt cake or something. It comes out. It derives its shape. It it conforms to the plan, to the pan. He says, be not conformed to this world. Don't take your shape. Don't derive your identity from the world around you. But, but he says in Romans 12, too, and here's where some in, in, of God's people, here's where some have misunderstood or have not really gotten the point. He said, be not conformed to the world. He did not say, be conformed to the church. Be conformed to me. Be conformed to to my way of life. He did not say, being, be conformed. Being conformed isn't good enough. He said, be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, it's not enough just to fit in with what's right. We go from fitting in with the world. Some have gone from fitting in with the world to fitting in with God's people. It's not enough just to fit in. What God is after is a transformation from the inside out. A renewal in our mind. That's more than just fitting in with and sort of looking around saying, oh, okay, well, you know, make a couple of changes and, and, and I'll fit in. 
That's conformity, and conformity is not good enough. Unfortunately, that's all some have, have done. I'm talking about just over the centuries, over the years. That's all some have done. They have conformed and fit in with the people of God. But nothing real happened on the inside. There was nothing lasting. A transformation is permanent, is, is a change of permanent nature. Conformity is just temporarily fitting in with, deriving shape and identity from. God is writing His laws in our hearts and in our minds so that we will be far more than just in conformity. But it has to do with an inward transformation. You see, the real cleansing God is after is a cleansing of heart and mind and attitude. He wants us at the wedding supper of the Lamb. We've been invited. We've been called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. But brethren, we have to make ourselves ready. We have to make ourselves ready. Which means that we have to be aware that we can't just come as we are. First fellow back in Matthew 22, he tried that. He showed up just as he was. He was cast out. He didn't have on a wedding garment. He didn't make any changes in his life. He thought he could come as he was. We, we can't do that. We can't, you know, make some changes, get a wedding garment on, and then go get the thing dirty and defiled and, and show up, you know, with, with, a, with a dirty wedding garment. No, we've got to overcome. And we certainly can't get our wedding garment on and then take it off and show up without any clothes on at all. That sure won't get us in. We've got to have on the robes, you know, the garments of salvation, the robes of righteousness. That's the way of God's law, God's way of life. All thy commandments are righteousness, we're told in Psalm 119, verse 172. God makes possible our being cleaned up. We've all been defiled. Our, but we can change and we can put on the wedding garment. Put on clean garments, pure and white. To the lamb, it's, we're told that the lamb's wife has made herself ready. She's bathed and she's washed in the water and the word. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. The fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Brethren, we've been invited to the wedding supper, and we want to be there in a clean, white garment. As we come before God in Pente at Pentecost in another week, we need to be thinking in, in those terms and thinking in terms of what is going to be involved in our being part of the ultimate fulfillment and completion of this festival.